Dickinson called Pentecost, this grace that scorches us. If we didn't know it before, we surely know it now, as the second chapter of Acts unfolds. This is no tame God who comes to us, no safe and predictable deity. This is the God who's loving sometimes takes the form of scorching. Before he left, Jesus told his friends he would send them the Advocate, the Comforter. Now we see this Comforter coming as wind, as flame, reminding us that comfort is not always comfortable, for it makes itself known in community where we find the most searing challenges and the deepest blessings we will ever know. <clears throat> From that moment of experience of the Spirit, whether it was on Easter night as John's Gospel implies in chapter 20, or 50 days after the resurrection as Luke and the Acts speak about, this experience of the Spirit of God, the gift of the risen Jesus to his disciples, the love between the Father and the Son expressed in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, they comes down upon them, upon 120 of them at the beginning, and things are never the same thereafter. From the moment of that experience, and as the reading from Acts says, all of a sudden, all of those people who were in Jerusalem for the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, which at one point in time was a harvest festival of the early grain that had been growing, being brought in, and then later became a festival celebrating the giving of the Torah, all of these people from various places are gathered there to celebrate God's generosity and the giving of the law. But now there's even more generosity. And there's a new law that's given in the power of the Spirit so that these people, as they say, how is it that these who are speaking here, that are Galileans, that we can hear them in our own languages. Because the Galileans came from the north, and this is happening in Jerusalem in the south. And so, there they are, hearing the good news, hearing that God in Christ had reconciled the world to himself, hearing in their own languages what God wanted to do, how God wanted to fill them, how God wanted to change their lives and change the world through them, that all would be made new if they would come to know and believe in the love of God expressed in the person of Jesus. And so here they are being, in a sense, challenged by the words they're hearing and able to understand to be able to come to this faith. And as things develop after this particular day when Peter is preaching at one time 3,000 people receive the Holy Spirit and then it just continues as they are baptized and they receive the Spirit or in a couple instances in the Acts the Spirit comes down upon them but they haven't been baptized yet but nevertheless they now experience the power of God and the wisdom of God and the strength of God and the wisdom of God in a way that they never did before. And it was transformative of their lives. That's why when she talks about being, being scorched, she's not talking about you know, something literal but that within the community that formed around this experience, 
that they began to relate differently to each other and to even look at the people outside of that number as differently, they looked at them differently, didn't see them as, as enemies, didn't see them as people to uh, be afraid of, but saw them as beloved sons and daughters of God who needed to be welcomed in to this experience, to be welcomed in to the life and death and resurrection of Christ, who into the life of the Spirit, so that they could become fully alive in God as it was intended by God from the beginning. And so it does, and so it goes, and this is what happens. And it's not that it doesn't become opposed. I mean, even in that first lesson, some people are saying, ah, they're just drunk, you know. They're filled with new wine. And it's kind of funny that Peter says, well, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. What do you mean they're drunk? Well, I suppose if you want to drink, the time of day doesn't matter. But in, nevertheless, things are happening that they just cannot explain other than this is God's doing. And they're not, as some of us might think, speaking in tongues as we hear elsewhere in the New Testament. But they're speaking in known languages. Speaking in tongues is an unknown language that needs an interpretation. The people didn't need an interpretation. They heard and they were invited to respond. And those that did experienced a new life. St. Paul, when he writes about how the Spirit operates in our lives, in that second lesson today in Romans, he talks about how in our experience of, of growing in faith, there come times when we don't know how we should pray. We're not sure how to ask. We're not sure how to, to give our glory to God. We're not sure how we ought to go about something. And he said that's when the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we don't know how to pray as we ought. And that the Spirit makes, makes supplication of God in groanings that are not human speech that we couldn't understand if we heard them. But we're being reminded that even when we are at a loss, the Holy Spirit is at work in us, praying for us, putting before God our deepest needs and intentions. Because that's the desire of our heart at that moment, and we may not be able to put it into words, but the Spirit does. And see, this is that gift that we have received that we don't think about very often. But you know, last week there was an experience not of, of uh, you know, flames or of the house shaking or something, but during our vestry retreat last week, there was a moment on Saturday when we were dealing with our retreat director, Father Greg uh, Morris, the rector of St. Andrews in Downers Grove. And there was a point at which one of our people raised a couple of questions that then opened up a whole different approach to things that really then became a catalyst for the rest of the day that was in itself transformative of how we have been speaking and how we have been feeling. It got us, in a sense, unstuck from where we were. And it wasn't anything more profound than just questioning some conclusions that we had reached previously. Now, I may not sound like any great shakes, and since you don't know exactly what I'm talking about in detail, it may just seem like it's more stuff up in the clouds someplace. But it was a moment of the Holy Spirit's action among us that you'll be able to hear about soon, read about soon. But how it, it just changed everything that we were going through at that time. And really energized us for the rest of the time we were there. 
to help us to formulate things and to push us to the next, the next things that we have to do. And you may have had the experience yourself that maybe you've been praying for something or thinking over something or, or wondering about what to do and then something will pop in your mind. You can attribute that to you know our subconscious mind, but sometimes we know it's the work of the Holy Spirit when we have not only the idea but also the energy released to make that phone call to finally approach that person and ask for forgiveness or to take the risk of, of wanting to share our faith with this person that we've been thinking about but we've been afraid to and then all of a sudden we just kind of find the moment, the opportunity and we speak. Or when we get over a major hurdle that we have been, you know, trying to get over uh, because of, uh, you know, something that has happened to us or, or some kind of, uh, just an obstacle that we keep running into. And all of a sudden we're able to overcome that. Maybe it's even something in our own life we've been trying to change. And finally we manage to do so. And we might think, oh, it's just my willpower, or it's just that finally I got enough guts to do this. But many times, if we've taken that to prayer, that's the Holy Spirit pushing us over the line, making us able to get over the hurdle, being able to, to finally break out of that habit that may be dragging us down or making life miserable for the people around us. So that's a mis the great mystery, but it's the gift of the risen Christ to us. One of the reasons why when the church calendar was reformed in the 1970s and Ascension Thursday was in a sense demoted as the end of the Easter season, and that it was, it was extended to Pentecost, was to make it clear that the gift of the Holy Spirit came from the risen Christ and the Father. But it was the gift of the risen Lord and that we come to experience through our baptism. That's one of the reasons why all Easter season there's been water in the baptismal font. And in case you wonder, it's been changed a few times, so it's not as grungy <laughs> as it, it could have been. But the water has been there precisely to remind us of this connection. Because that's how we came into contact with the Holy Spirit at the beginning when we were baptized. So I want to just conclude with this uh, excerpt from the what's called the ascetical treatises of uh, St. Isaac of Nineveh. When the spirit dwells with a person from the moment that person has become a prayer the spirit never leaves them. For the Spirit himself never ceases to pray within us. Whether we are asleep or awake, from then on prayer never departs from our soul. Whether we are eating or drinking or sleeping or whatever else we may be doing, even if we are in the deepest of sleeps, the incense of prayer is rising without effort in our heart. Prayer never again deserts us. In every moment of our life, even when it appears to have ceased, prayer is secret, secretly at work within us continuously. One of the fathers, the bearers of Christ, teaches that prayer is the silence of the pure in heart, for their very thoughts are the movements of God. The movements of the heart and the intellect that have been purified become voices full of sweetness with which such people never cease to sing in secret 
to the hidden God. It may sound like something that we can't imagine in ourselves, but if we truly are seeking every day of our life to grow in this relationship with God, our prayer then can become that constant that Isaac speaks about, that the Spirit, because of the purity of our heart, will continue to offer those prayers and supplications and groans beyond human speech, those things that express the very depth of our, of our love, our concern, our worry, what have you. And it's that same spirit that makes it possible for us by his descent upon the gifts that are placed on this altar the body and blood of Christ to be here for us, to be our spiritual food and drink. It's that descent that consecrates. It's that descent that renews the face of the earth, that renews you and me.